little bit of background information. Um, my name is Sydney Archidiakno. I am currently uh, working as a data science intern for a biosciences startup called Greenlight Biosciences. Um, this whole dive into graph convolutional networks actually started with a term project. So um, I'm really excited to see there's a lot of people in this room who have worked with graph neural networks or graph convolutional networks. Some of you might even be able to teach me um, a few things. So I'm going to leave a lot of time for discussion at the end. Um, so any questions you have, I'll be looking at the chat at the end. And Bill has let me know at the end, we'll also allow you to unmute yourself so we can have a good discussion as well. So I'm very excited about that. Very excited to talk to you all. And once again, thank you very much for joining us today. So today we are talking about graph convolutional networks. Um, just a little bit of background. When we reference graphs, we're talking about graphs in the sense of networks. We're talking about graphs in the sense of nodes and edges. So why we care? Um, we'll get to this in a little bit, but as most of you know, which is probably the reason you're here, there's a lot of data that we work with as data scientists that is best represented as graphs. So let's get started. In this talk, the objectives are to break down the terminology and explain what a graph convolutional network is, explain the intuition. We'll be talking through the mathematics at a very high level, and we'll also be talking about the architectures of GCNs a little bit and how these might differ from traditional convolutional neural networks. We are also going to get hands-on with a code walkthrough. So I'll be providing a notebook and we're going to walk through a little bit about how to implement GCNs using some libraries that already exist for Python. So what are GCNs? Um, basically, they're neural networks which leverage convolutions on graph structured data. There have been several different implementations of GCNs. Primarily, we'll be talking about spectral GCNs at a high level and then spatial GPN, GCNs as uh, proposed by Kipf and Welling in their paper from 20, uh, 2015, I believe. So when I talk about the mathematics of GCNs, we'll be talking mostly about that implementation, although later and more modern implementations do exist. So one thing that I hear quite a bit is GNNs or graph neural networks and GCNs, graph convolutional networks, these terms being used relatively interchangeably. Sometimes that's correct, but just to break down a little bit more, um, graph neural networks or GNNs are any neural network which can work on graph structured data. Graph convolutional networks are, of course, a subset of these, um, which specifically leverage convolutions. So as I mentioned, what makes these networks interesting? Um, one of the reasons that I got very interested in graph convolutional networks was when I was studying graph theory for a data structures course and thinking about all of the different things in this world, which just really can't necessarily be fully represented um, in the typical Euclidean structures that we work with as data scientists or machine learning engineers. For example, food webs, social networks, molecular structures, um, all of these different things and many, many more examples are best represented as graphs or networks. We need to understand the connections between the data as well as just the values or the features of the data itself. So take a moment to think, and you don't have to answer this right now, but just think kind of to yourself, what data in your domain, whatever industry you work in, might require this kind of representation? Some of you who've already worked with graph neural networks or graph convolutional networks are very close to this question. Um, some of you might not have thought about this before. So just kind of think about this for yourself for just a moment. And as you think about this, let's talk about what we can do with graph convolutional networks. There are a myriad of different things that these networks can be useful for. For example, node level prediction. So if we wanna predict a person in a social network, Graph level prediction, for example, if we want to predict a whole protein. Link level prediction, we can predict a relationship between two users. Graph embedding, translating a graph into two dimensions while maintaining our understanding of the structure, a representation of the structure. Community detection, so we can cluster nodes based on a graph's edge structure. And graph generation, for example, we could generate new molecules. So 
these are all very exciting things um, depending on our problem space. So moving forward. There are some other types of graph neural networks, as we mentioned. The primary non-convolutional graph neural network that shows up in the literature is going to be graph recurrent neural networks. For the sake of this talk today, since we're specifically talking about GCNs, we're going to skip these. Although there's lots of really interesting literature on these as well, if you're interested. Today, we will talk about, however, spatial and spectral graph convolutional networks. These are the other two primary types of graph neural networks that show up in the literature most often. So diving a little bit deeper, spatial graph convolutional networks and spectral graph convolutional networks differ in how they calculate their or how they compute their convolutions. So spatial GCNs understand the properties of a node based on its local neighborhood, whereas spectral graph convolutional networks use the eigen decomposition of the graph Laplacian to understand the graph structure. And again, we'll get a little bit more into the math at a high level in a moment. So why convolutions? Um, why do we want to use convolutions on graph structured data at all? Well, we've seen from advances in computer vision, we've seen from traditional convolutional neural networks, that convolutions are effective at understanding patterns in complex data. You can think of an image, which is one of the most common use cases of a convolutional neural network. You can think of an image as a graph. It's a graph with specific neighborhoods of nodes. It has a set structure and there's a set amount of distance and space that that, that that image takes up. We know how many pixels. For example, we know that we have a 72 by 72 pixel image. So we can take for granted some information about each node or each pixel's neighborhood based on this understanding. With graphs, convolutions are very useful as well, but we're going to get into a little bit how we need to calculate the convolutions differently for graphs, which take up an arbitrary amount of space. And we can't necessarily take for granted their, their neighborhood information like we can with an image. So first let's get into spectral GCNs. These are the GCNs with, I would say personally, a slightly more complex mathematical foundation. And again, I'm going over this at a very high level Although in the repo that I will be sharing later for the code walkthrough, there are resources where you can read more about this if you're interested. So for both types of GCN, we're going to have to represent our graph in a way that our program can understand. So traditionally, this is done with an adjacency matrix and a degree matrix. An adjacency matrix is an n by n matrix, where n is the number of nodes in our graph, and it represents connections between nodes in, in our graph. Many of you may have seen these before, but if you haven't, it's a matrix where the column labels are node labels, and there's a zero or a one in intersecting rows and columns. One represents a connection, zero represents no connection, and this is considering an unweighted graph. A uh, degree matrix is a diagonal matrix which represents the degree of each node. The degree of each node is the number of edges connected to each node. So spectral GCNs can go a few steps further. They use this information to compute the Laplacian matrix for the graph, compute the eigen decomposition of decomposition of the Laplacian. And then examining some of the properties of this, we're able to examine the orthonormal Fourier basis of our graph. Basically, once we can define our Fourier transform, we can compute our convolutions. The Fourier transform is one of the things that's often used to compute convolutions for a traditional convolutional neural network. So once we can approximate the Fourier transform for our graph, we can then move forward computing our convolutions similar to how we would with a traditional convolutional neural network. For spatial GCNs, we do things a little bit differently. We aggregate a node's neighborhood information. So this formula is a forward propagation formula as seen in the Kipp and Welling paper. And this represents the symmetric normalization of the adjacency and the degree matrix. The symmetric normalization is this right here. So D represents our degree matrix. It's D hat 
because this represents the degree matrix and the adjacency matrix after having enforced self loops by adding our adjacency matrix to its identity matrix. And we multiply both of these by each other to the one, the negative one half degree. And this is how Kipp and Welling proposed symmetric normalization. So we effectively add this term to our forward propagation function in spatial GCNs. So now that we understand a little bit about the difference between how spatial and spectral GCNs are computed, how do you choose? How do you know which one's better? They've both performed very well on benchmark data sets. And spatial graph convolutional networks take a little bit less computation, but spectral graph convolutional networks, some say in the literature, provide a better computational understanding of the graph structure. Um, what it's really going to come down to is the nature of your data. For example, there's a protein-protein interaction or a PPI benchmark data set. And in their original white paper, they do mention that they use a spatial GCN because their data set is comprised of a variety of graphs. These graphs each represent proteins and they're not necessarily related to each other. So each graph represents a protein structure and because it's just effectively a variety of graphs of different proteins, the graphs don't necessarily have an intrinsic relation to each other. So oftentimes, like many problems in data science, machine learning, engineering, you wanna look at what kind of data you have to work with. When we talk about the architecture of a GCN, it's very similar to the architecture of a typical CNN or convolutional neural network. We're first going to start by feature extraction. We're going to pass our graph through localized convolutional layers and pooling filters. We're then going to map the resulting matrices using, for example, a local pooling layer. And then dense layers are used to create the final output. So this is very similar to what you'll see with a CNN, a convolutional neural network. The key difference between a traditional CNN and a GCN lie in how we represent our data and calculate our convolutions. So there's an extra step here. A traditional CNN, depending on what kind of data we're giving it, we're going to do our typical data exploration, cleaning, and so on. But the GCN gives us an extra step because we have to create those adjacency matrices and those degree matrices. If you're working with a benchmark data set, um, you'll see in our coding walkthrough, we use a benchmark data set that's already been um, implemented with a library called Spectral. So we don't have to do all of this dirty work ourselves. We don't have to uh, write the code to build the graph from our data to then create our adjacency matrix and our uh, degree matrix. However, if you're working on a problem for work, for example, you might not have this, this privilege. So you might have to do that, those extra steps yourself to represent your graph and calculate the convolutions. So we are going to do it together. I am going to stop sharing my screen for a moment so that I can paste this link in chat. I'm going to share a Jupyter Notebook with you that you can either just pull up in Jupyter Notebook, you can clone the code and just pull it up. And then um, if you don't prefer to do that, you can also open a new collab document and you could just go to file and then open from Jupyter Notebook. So I'm going to drop this link in chat. Okay, so I'm going to give everyone a couple minutes to get this pulled up. Um, if you want, give a thumbs up or some other reaction. Once I see a couple people um, giving some reactions, I'll know to go ahead and get going. But I want to give you all a moment to pull this up if you want to follow along. <laughs> 
And Jenny, I hope that this answers your question. Can you show an example of the input data going into a GCN? I will show you an example using this specific library. Um, for other examples, for example, if you're interested in seeing input data that someone has collected that doesn't just be like that isn't just read in from a benchmark data set, I won't be showing that today. Although, um, let me think, I might be able to think of a quick example that I might be able to post in chat. I'll think about that if I can, if I can post that. And Abhik, to answer your question, Spectral is written on top of TensorFlow. Um, you will see, and I'll talk about a little bit, um, you'll also see that it, it leverages a lot of the, the typical Keras layers. As a machine learning engineer, if you use TensorFlow, you'll be very familiar with the syntax we'll be seeing. All right, and it looks like a couple of people already. So let's go ahead and get started. So as I just mentioned, as I just answered to Apik, um, we're going to be using a library called Spectral for Python to demonstrate the implementation of GCNs. Um, it's built on TensorFlow and Keras. Another great alternative that I tend to actually prefer is PyTorch Geometric. Um, Spectral is fabulous for getting a model up and running very quickly. You just have to pip install Spectral. PyTorch Geometric will be more comfortable if you prefer PyTorch over TensorFlow. It just takes a little bit more time to get set up, which is why I've omitted it for the sake of this walkthrough. So the Proteins data set is the data set that we'll be using. Um, I chose this data set because I also wrote an article um, with a tutorial for working with the proteins data set. So I figured that that would give you a good reference if you have any more questions. I'm going to be doing everything at a very high level today. So if you're interested in learning more about the feature representations, what we're classifying, what we're doing, I definitely recommend that you go through the repository that I've shared, click on the to uh, Dortmuth's data set and read a little bit more about proteins so that you can learn a little bit more. So as we walk through, um, I already have some output loaded here, but I'll go ahead and walk through, run the code as well. Let me know, feel free to raise your hand if you have any questions about the code part of it. I think that part will be easier to understand while we have this up in front of us. Spectral, is this library right here and it has some data sets loaded in so if you're interested in just getting started with gcns just playing around with them spectral protein interaction data set um reddit data sets that are really good to play around with. A lot of white papers exist for these, as well as a lot of existing code implementations. You can compare and contrast results. Reading is just uh, from spectral.datasets, import the TU dataset class. Give the TU dataset class the name of the specific dataset from that class that you want to read in. And when you run this cell, you'll see it'll download it, and it will also show you if you output data, the number of graphs. So again, we're working with 1,113 graphs. Each graph represents a protein. So some of you might know, but if you don't, a protein is a chain of amino acids. So what these graphs are going to represent are going to be amino acids and bonds between those amino acids. Using the Kip and Welling implementation of a GPN, CN, sorry, we Spectral transforms and effectively Spectral provides a GCN filter that does a lot of the work that we spoke about before. So this is going to be a spatial graph convolutional network. And this filter is going to be applied to all of our data in our, in our data set. So to every graph in the data set. And effectively it's going to do the work to, you could say, represent our data the way that it needs to be represented for this convolutional neural net or this graph convolutional network implementation. So that means that it's going to enforce self loops and it is going to also do some normalization for us. And this is a great library to start playing around with again, because you don't have to write the code yourself. Although if you're interested, I do recommend looking at the source code in the spectral documentation 
to see how this is done if you're interested. Moving on to this cell right here that says in six, we're going to split our train and test data. For this walkthrough, I'm just doing an 80-20 split um, after randomly shuffling the data. Definitely encourage some better train test split methodology for your work, but for practice and just a walkthrough, this is what we're doing here. So we import NumPy. We use NumPy's shuffle method, which is from the random uh, module and we shuffle our data. So this is going to basically shift the graphs around in a different order so that when we split it, we're not always getting first 80 and the last 20, for example. We then split our data just using the syntax. You'll see here in this next cell that we're going to import a lot of the layers that you import when working with TensorFlow and Keras. We're going to import the model base class. We're going to import a dense and a dropout layer. Dense is going to give us our output representation and dropout is going to give us our, our random dropout to try to avoid overfitting. From spectral layers, we are then going to import GCN conf, which is the Kipf and Welling implementation of a graph convolutional network layer and global sum pool. Because we're doing graph level prediction, we want to make sure that we integrate some, some global pooling. So this also should look very similar um, to most of you who've done a lot of machine learning engineering work or who've done a lot of projects working with TensorFlow and Keras. We're going to subclass our model. So we're going to define class proteins GNN and we're going to inherit from our model base class from, from Keras. We're going to initialize with self number of hidden layers and then number of labels. Number of, number of labels will be our number of classification labels. So if we want to print, for example, I just print it here. So we have two labels in our data set. So basically this is going to be binary classification, say one or two. We're going to define each layer here in our init. We're going to define our graph convolutional layer. We're gonna pass in the number of hidden layers that we want. Define our pooling layer, our dropout layer, here we've initialized dropout frequency to 0.5 or 50%. Um, a lot of people typically will start with 0.4, start with 0.5, up to you. Feel free to play around with any of these parameters. My goal here is less to focus on outcome and more to focus on just sharing how to implement this with the library. We pass our number of labels to our dense layer. We're going to get a softmax activation function and then we're going to call. So we're basically going to pass our output through these layers. Call is something that's actually implemented in spectral. Um, so this is just something to keep in mind. Feel free to, again, look at the spectral source code and look at the source code for different ways to implement this call method. So these next two cells are going to be very common in pretty much any machine learning project that you're doing with TensorFlow and Keras. So most of you have probably seen these before. We're going to instantiate our model. We're going to give it our batch size and we're going to give it our number of labels. Or I'm sorry, we're going to give it our number of hidden layers and we're going to give it our number of labels. Then we're going to compile our model with our optimizer. We're using Atom and our loss function, categorical entropy. And then the trick is that we can't just call fit right away. So we're going to use loaders. So Spectral walks us through loaders. Loaders create mini batches for iterating over. And we're going to use the recommended loader for Spectral just because this is an experiment. This is going to be the best documented one. So you can look up this loader later in the Spectral documentation, find a lot of information on it. So we're going to imp import batch loader from Spectral data. Um, their data module is their module for 
data pre-processing and things like that. We're going to instantiate our loader. We're going to give it our training data and set our batch size. Here's where we set our batch size. So once we have instantiated our loader, we're going to pass it calling the load method to the fit method. So basically the loader is effectively a generator, which is going to create mini batches. And then we're going to give it our loader steps per epoch uh, uh, property, sorry. We're going to give it our steps per epoch property and run through 10 epochs. Again, we're not so worried about outcomes here, just about showing how to do this. So here we run through our epochs, we get our loss, not the best that we've ever seen. This definitely is going to indicate that we probably want to explore our data a little bit further and we probably want to adjust some parameters a little bit. And then we're going to instantiate a test loader. So we're going to instantiate a batch loader on our test data, give it a batch size, and then we'll see how it does on our test data. So um, our loss here, and we can see that we have now implemented a graph convolutional network in spectral. Um, it's very, very easy to get started with these libraries. The biggest thing with graph convolutional networks getting into this is understanding the data. So that's going to be something that is a lot harder to walk through since it's so specific to what data you're using. The biggest thing is going to be that as opposed to a lot of say Keras layers, Keras tutorials and so on, it's really easy to pull different layers out of the box and just play with different data. What I found is that you can't just pull layers from spectral out of the box and run it with any data without understanding the data, the feature representations, and how things need to be adjusted to use these convolutional layers from spectral. So I definitely encourage any of you to go on, play with this, use different data, and see, gain an understanding of how to use graph convolutional networks by making those adjustments and understanding your data. And with that, I want to open things up for questions and discussion. Are there any questions on the code portion before I look to the chat? Uh, okay, just a quick so reminder. To... Sorry, I just quickly remind if we have questions, uh, feel free to post in the chat. And if you prefer to speak, ask questions, uh, you can raise your hand. Uh, I will uh, unmute you to speak uh, comments and uh, follow up questions too. Okay, so I'm going to start going through the chat. So, Amir. From India asked, do we need a GPU enabled? I was able to run this in Jupyter with no GPU enabled, fine. And it didn't take too long um, because we're just running for 10 epochs. Um, let me know if you have any problems, but you shouldn't need a GPU enabled just to run this notebook out of the box. And Dave asked a really great question. If a graph does not have a regular pattern, how can the same convolutional weights be used on different parts of the graph? So I want to think about this. I want to give, I want to give hopefully a, a good answer here. So my understanding, and again, um, anyone in here who's worked with graph convolutional networks actually might be able to give you a better answer um, than I can, but I from my understanding, working with graph convolutional networks, the spatial graph convolutional networks are going to use these small batches to traverse over, to, to iterate over the graph. And the weights will be updated based on the feature representations, like within the, the different neighborhoods of nodes within the different batches. And then these are all going to be pooled. Um, and so, using these representations and the normalization of the adjacency matrix, we're able to effectively traverse over neighborhoods of the graph to um, 
learn on these neighborhoods and to then pull the aggregate weights for the neighborhood. Let me know if I'm not answering your question well. I'm happy to, to try to clarify. Uh, Mason, yes, uh, I personally also prefer PyTorch over TensorFlow. And F, you asked, what are the criteria for dropout? Um, do you want to clarify that question? I'm not sure if you're asking what the dropout does, what it should be initialized to, or what are the criteria for determining dropout? Do you mind clarifying? And then Amir, there are edges mentioned in the data. So let me go and pull up. something that might help you understand a little bit more. Okay, so this is a good question, and I definitely like to um, explain the data a little bit better. So here we can see a little bit more about the data set. So we're using the proteins data set. Again, we have 1,113 graphs. These each represent proteins. Um, this is going to show you, so there's 162 edges. So this is 162 edges um, within the first graph of the data set. So the first graph of the data set has 162 edges. That means that there's 162 connections between nodes. The average node degree is 3.86. For each node, on average, you're going to have four edges connected to the nodes. Out of the box, it doesn't have any isolated nodes or nodes that cannot be traversed to. And it doesn't uh, contain self loops out of the, the box. It is also an undirected graph. Um, as well. And thank you all for resharing. Okay, so um, then to clarify F's question, F asked about explaining the dropout criteria. So dropout is effectively um, a way in machine learning that we try to, specifically with neural networks, that we try to avoid overfitting. Dropout is basically going to be the percentage, the frequency of the time that specific weights within our neural network as it learned are dropped to zero. And the reason for this random dropping to zero, the intuition behind it is basically that by doing this, you try to avoid the different neurons overlearning or um, like over, basically you want to prevent overfitting by preventing the nodes from overlearning. So if you randomly zero out specific weights, the intuition is that the other neurons are going to effectively, you could say, pick up the slack without getting too deep into dropout. So, Uh, Yan Wei, please let me know if I'm saying your name incorrectly. You asked, what about Stellar Graph? Um, I'm not aware of that. I'm, if that's another um, tool or another GCN implement, uh, implementation, definitely happy um, to hear about it. And Amir asked, so if someone needs to create the graph for input for large data sets, how typically would this be created in production? That's a big question to answer. Um, and that depends really on what your use case is, where you're working, um, and what you mean kind of by in production. Um, if you need to create the graph for input, so say this isn't a production scale model and I'm just creating a project. If I'm just creating a project and I have data that I wanna represent as a graph, I have to write the code or alternatively, um, find a library to uh, basically implement the data in an adjacency matrix. So typically you would write the code for creating a graph for appending nodes and edges, traversing the graph, et cetera. That's how you would typically do it yourself 
in production, um, I'm actually not sure. I have not done any production scale graph convolutional network work. I know that someone earlier mentioned that they were doing some. Um, if anyone wants to share their own knowledge, um, I'm happy to hear it. However, I would imagine that in production for a large data set, you would likely want to use a different representation of your data either from the start. I know a lot of companies use Neo4j, which is a graph database, or you would likely want to um, ensure the representation of your data before it's fed into a model in production. Neil, you asked a very interesting question about reverse engineering these techniques to identify connections that aren't predefined. I am definitely sure that there is. This isn't something that I've delved into, although I would be excited to talk to you about this later if you want to um, continue this conversation about thinking through how you could solve that problem. And yes, F, that's correct. So 50% of the time, um, a neuron, uh, not a node, a neuron would be uh, dropped out or zeroed out. Dave, um, it's going to be KIPF, K-I-P-F, and Welling. And thank you all. And then Rupesh, uh, GCN versus CNN. So the benefit of a GCN is that it works on graph structured data. A typical convolutional neural network uses convolutions, but you can't just feed a graph into a typical convolutional network and have it compute the convolutions correctly because it can't handle the, uh, the data correctly. So we basically need to take a couple extra steps to account for the fact that our data is arbitrary in space. So whereas a convolutional neural network can take in an image, which can be thought of as a fixed graph with a set of fixed dimensions, and we can take for granted the neighborhood information of that graph. A GCN can take in a graph like the proteins, can take in data, for example, like the proteins data set, which is full of arbitrary graphs of different numbers of nodes, different numbers of degrees, and different numbers of edges. And it can take in those representations and it can deal with the arbitrary structure through kind of the, the tricks for computing the convolutions that authors have, have thought of. You could, you could think of it that way. And can you describe a typical real life application for a GCN? Yeah. Um, a lot of the papers around these benchmark data sets are really, really cool to read, especially for reading typical real life applications um, for GCNs. One of my favorites is on the QM9 data set, which is a small molecule data set. Um, it has different molecule, uh, different atoms, sorry, represented and their chemical bonds. The goal for the QM9 data set, one of the first benchmark papers, and I have it cited in the repo that I've shared with you all. Um, the goal was to effectively predict chemical properties of uh, new molecules. So using GCNs, um, they were able to embed the molecular structure data that they have in the GM9 or in the QM9, sorry, data set. And they were able to then use this training data to attempt to predict the chemical properties of new molecules. This is really important for physicists and for um, say material scientists and things like that, as well as biologists. A lot of these problems, these biological problems, these chemical uh, chemistry problems, a lot of these problems are difficult because we have algorithms to approximate things, but they take a very long time to compute. And they're also an approximation. GCNs are also, you know, they're not always going to give you the exact correct answer, but they might be able to give you a range of potential classifications or answers or predictions that you can then go test or you can then go calculate and it cuts your work time down quite a bit. Um, J1, W1 also said pharmacists. Um, I would imagine that there's a lot of uh, pharmacological use for this as well. And can GCNs be pre-structured with domain specific information? Dale uh, hit from the USA asked that. That's a really great question. And I'm actually not sure. The GCNs that I've studied so far, um, and again, this is something that started with a term project. The GCNs that I've studied before aren't necessarily pre-structured with domain specific information. Although I can see applications where it might be useful 
to develop an algorithm or develop um, an architecture where it tends to work for your use case. For example, um, I work for uh, a biosciences company. I can think of lots of lots of times in biotech where you would want to kind of design your algorithm with specific, say, genomics knowledge in mind or specific calculations in mind. So I'm sure that you could do that. I haven't come across any in the literature yet. Um, yeah, so uh, social graphs, like from the Facebook graph API, uh, definitely are a really great use case for these as well. Um, social networks are their networks, their graphs. And that's actually one of the areas, as far as I'm aware, where um, graph convolutional networks really were kind of initially seen to be very useful. I think now it's trickling into the, the biotech and some other spaces as well. But I think in 2015, 2016, 2017, when a lot of this literature was first kind of um, coming out and it was more novel, I believe that you know social networks and you know recommending friends and trying to see how closely connected two people might be based on certain features these are things that GCNs would be would be really good for. So Dave, there's some talk in the literature about spectral GCNs providing a better representation or better uh, allowing the model to understand and provide more meaningful predictions. Although this has kind of been debated as like spectral GCNs and Spatial GCNs have both performed very, very well on some of the same benchmark data sets, QM9 being an example. Um, it's really hard to say. So what I've read in the literature is that some, some um, authors think that rather than just aggregating node neighborhood information, actually computing the um, for your transform for the graph. So going through those extra steps with the Laplacian and finding the orthonormal Fourier uh, basis for the graph basically represents the graph better computationally, i.e. like it doesn't lose information through aggregation is kind of the argument. Um, again, it's I haven't found anything that concretely says or proves to me that spectral versus spatial GCNs are better than each other. I think it's like a lot of things in computer science where there are trade-offs, one of them being computation time, um, difficulty to implement and things like that, and the other being the outcome. So I would maybe have to dive a little bit deeper into the literature to see, you know, to compare more outcomes, but based on what I've seen, it seems to be very much up for debate. Ayush, this is a really great question. Um, Ayush from India asked, do you see any applications in anomaly detection using spatial GCNs? Um, anomaly detection for um, what purpose? I think that would help me be able to answer this question better. I know um, what comes to my mind is computer vision applications for anomaly detection, for example, for production materials. Um, but anomaly detection could mean, could mean quite, a, quite a bit of things. material analysis. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly without being a, a physicist or a chemist or, or an expert, uh, I think that there's possibly potential there. I think it really just depends on, like so many things in data science and machine learning, um, it's really easy to get very excited about um, different techniques and things like that and say, okay, I'm going to make my problem fit to this technique rather than saying, I want to start from actually understanding my problem. Um, so again, without being an expert, I really can't say without totally understanding the problems that occur in material analysis. It's really hard for me to say. Um, if this is a field that you work in, you understand your data, you understand your problem space a lot better than I do. So it's something to potentially, you know, take back and um, you know, look through what data you have and try to understand if that's, that's something that could help you out. Yeah, you're welcome. Dave, I'm reading your question. Um, oh, sorry. Um, 
I'm reading your question, uh, Dave. The word spectral usually means a frequency domain representation. How can a graph have a frequency domain representation? Um, the mathematics behind spectral GCNs are something that I've studied a little bit less than the mathematics behind spatial GCNs. From my understanding, you're able to use some of the properties of the Laplacian matrix derived from the adjacency and the degree matrix to um, estimate, uh, I'm sorry, you're able to use the properties to estimate the Fourier basis, but you're also able to compute the uh, eigen decomposition. And effectively, this is able to Um, this is able to, I'm, I'm reaching for the right words here. Estimate the, um, to estimate like the frequency, I'm losing words, to able to basically estimate the, the frequency, the, um, the uh, vibration basis for the, for the Fourier transform, for the Fourier basis. I'm sorry, Dave, let me reach back out to you later and get you a better answer on that because I'm losing words today. And Bill, I think you had something to say, so I'll um, leave it over to you, but thank you everyone for the great questions and this great discussion. And thank you so much for being here today.